For 50 years, the feisty arts organism Palabolus has changed the way the world sees modern dance. Experience the company March 12th at New Jersey Performing Arts Center. As vibrant as ever, Palabolus puts the O in Big Five O, turning its tradition sideways and bringing its past into the future with works dynamically reimagined for a never before seen experience. Get your tickets today at njpac.org or ticketmaster.com. friends and welcome to the dance edit podcast i'm margaret fuhrer and i'm amy brandt we are editors at dance media here with our bi-weekly headline rundown episode so we will first run through a rather long list of dance news stories running the gamut from oregon ballet theater's new artistic director to rihanna's super bowl halftime performance and then we'll have a longer discussion segment on what is unfortunately the dance news story of the month and probably the year, choreographer Marco Goko's attack on critic Vibka Husta, and what the various responses to that attack have revealed. It's truly a surreal situation on multiple fronts. Yes. Yes. First, though, just a little call out for next week's interview episode. Um, We'll have a return guest, a friend of the pod, choreographer and director Francesca Harper, And she'll talk about the new film and performance work she's created for filmmaker Ava DuVernay's Law Enforcement Accountability Project. Harper's piece responds to a Detroit police officer's murder of seven-year-old Ayanna Monet Stanley Jones. It's a work of art that's also a work of activism. And Francesca talked with characteristic thoughtfulness about how she chose to approach a tragedy of this magnitude and about why dance storytelling is especially powerful in this context. So I hope you can tune in for that episode. That'll be out next Thursday, March 2nd. I can't wait to listen to that one. Okay, now it's time for our headline rundown, beginning with yet another ballet director announcement. Yes, Oregon Ballet Theater has announced that choreographer Danny Rowe will become the company's next artistic director, effective February 27th, so just in a few days here. Rowe has had quite the career. She was a principal dancer with both the Australian Ballet and Houston Ballet, then took her career in a new direction by joining Netherlands Dance Theater. And then since retiring from the stage, she's become quite the in-demand choreographer. I recently saw her world premiere Madcap at San Francisco Ballet, and everyone was talking about it. It was was really interesting. It was a really interesting ballet. Um, Anyway, she steps in after an 18-month search for a new artistic director at OBT, and uh, this will be her first directorship, although she's she's served as associate artistic director at um, SF Danceworks. Uh, But yeah, this will be her first kind of full-time artistic directorship position. So very excited for her. Yeah, big congrats to Danny. Point did... Amy, you and Point did this great interview with her. You did. And it sounds like she's really invested in the idea of new full-length ballets, which sounds super intriguing. Yeah. Yeah. We had a great conversation um, over lunch in San Francisco. And yeah, she she talked about commissioning kind of newer full-length ballets that are steeped in classical technique. That was one thing she really wanted to like. Mm Mm-hmm to point out that she thinks might be kind of missing from newer narrative ballets that could help their appeal a little more. I don't know. But, um, you know, she was also just really wanting to kind of get her bearings in Portland. It's like a total changing of the guard. Not only is Danny coming in as new artistic director, there's a new executive director and a new school director. So it's like a total fresh start for OBT. Yeah. We have that interview linked in the show notes. I hope you can give it a read. In a totally different corner of the dance universe, um, or rather the sports universe, really, earlier this month, Rihanna gave her first live performance in seven years, and in very Rihanna fashion, the comeback show was at the Super Bowl. The star's halftime show, which doubled as a pregnancy announcement, congratulations to Rihanna, was choreographed by go-to collaborator Paris Goebel, 
who's the dance mastermind behind the Savage by Fenty shows. It filled both the field and the sky with dozens of dancers. One section of the choreography in particular to Rude Boy has gone just crazy viral on TikTok and other social platforms, as have videos of Gobo rehearsing for the show with members of her royal family crew. There was a glorious moment, like maybe 10 days ago, where I found myself on Rihanna Dancer TikTok. My whole For You page was videos of these dancers who like were still wearing those white Fenty puffers that they wore on the field <laughs> days later, either talking about what it was like at the Super Bowl or like recreating the choreography. It was just the happiest corner of the internet for a while. I was really impressed with that performance. I don't know, between like all the dancers on those different levels in the sky going up and down and just like the unison and and um, just like the entire like big picture look of it. Super impressive. Yeah. So looking ahead to this summer, Jacob's Pillow Dance Festival has announced their 2023 lineup and it is quite spectacular. Mark Morse Dance Group will be performing its Burt Bachrock inspired look of love. Um, Dutch National Ballet will be making its festival debut, um, including performances by former Bolshoi star Olga Smirnova. So that should be exciting. And uh, there's also the U.S. premiere of Irish choreographer Una Doherty's Navy Blue. Festival will also celebrate the 50th anniversary of hip hop with works by Rennie Harris's Pure Movement American Street Dance Theater, Ladies of Hip Hop, and a new festival commission by Rockefeller and Quickstep, a duet. Lots to look forward to, as always. The 2023 class of Doris Duke artists was revealed earlier this month. It includes dance artists Ayadeli Cassell and Rosie Simas. Congratulations to both of them. Yay. And the Doris Duke was actually already the largest cash award for individual performing artists. But this year, the prize doubled. Each honoree will receive $550,000. Very real Whoa. money. Yeah. Yeah. You can do a lot with that. American postmodern dancer, multimedia artist, and choreographer Simone Forti has been awarded the Golden Lion for Lifetime Achievement at this year's Venice Biennale. Tao Dance Theater, which was founded by Tao Ye, Duan, Ni, and Wang Hao in Beijing in 2008, have been awarded the Silver Lion, an award that recognizes promising young artists in dance. So sort of the two ends of the spectrum there. They will be conferred at this year's 17th International Festival of Dance in July. Mark, congrats. Lots of dance folks to congratulate today. Also, Simone Forti gave just the most Simone Forti quote ever to the Times about receiving the Golden <laughs> Lion. It was something like, I didn't know what this award was, but if somebody's got to get it, I'll be happy to hold it on behalf of the dance community. <laughs> She's just like the most unbothered. I love it. I love it so much. <laughs> the Library of Congress recently announced that it had acquired a collection documenting choreographer Garth Fagan's work. The Jamaican-born Fagan, who founded Garth Fagan Dance back in 1970, is also the longest-running Black choreographer in Broadway history, thanks to his work on The Lion King, for which he won a Tony in 1998. The archive includes more than 30 years' worth of footage and rehearsal notes, and programs, and posters, and letters, and audio recordings. So, really rich collection. The ballet stage is about to get turned up to 11. Oh. Carlos Acosta has announced that his Birmingham Royal Ballet will perform an original three-act ballet to the music of heavy metal band Black Sabbath this September. The conceptual ballet will feature some of the band's biggest hits, including Iron Man, War Pigs, and Paranoid, reorchestrated for the Royal Symphonetta Orchestra. The band is one of Birmingham's most famous exports, and so this project is part of Acosta's larger vision to really honor the city's local culture. And the band is apparently quite excited for this collaboration, which I think is amazing. I don't know. I think I would totally see this. I'm curious. Yeah, no, definitely. And also just remember what Wayne McGregor did with the White Stripes music. So I, I'm, I'm really interested to hear Black Sabbath on an orchestra. Definitely. I actually, I was intrigued to hear that. So Christopher Austin, who orchestrated the White Stripes songs for Chroma for Wayne McGregor, is also working on this Black Sabbath ballet. So maybe that sort of a, gives us a sense oh, of what cool. it might sound like. Yeah. Um, and also Black Sabbath's guitarist might make a cameo. The whole thing is just, yeah, I'm endlessly intrigued. Oh wow. In Broadway news, 
Jujamson Theatres, which is one of Broadway's biggest landlords, is combining operations with the parent company of the Ambassador Theatre Group, which is a major player internationally and especially in London's West End. So Jujamson currently owns five Broadway theatres, and ATG owns or operates two of them. Um, we don't know much more yet about this deal, but Jujamson has traditionally opted for American plays and musicals rather than the big British exports, so there's been speculation that maybe that will change. Stay tuned. Christopher Wielden has been tapped to choreograph the upcoming Fred and Ginger feature film, which follows the untold love story of Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. Astaire, just to remind everyone, will be played by Jamie Bell of Billy Elliot fame, while Margaret Qualley will be portraying the luminous Ginger Rogers. The film begins production later this year, and uh, this is not to be confused with the other Fred Astaire biopic starring Tom Holland, who starred in the Billy Elliot stage production, coincidentally enough. So these two dueling Astaire biopics, that's so wild. Um, I love it. And and we have not heard yet who will be choreographing the Tom Holland project. So keeping our eyes on that. In uh, Glitch in the Matrix news, or what feels like it, Boop, the Betty Boop musical will have a pre-Broadway engagement beginning this November in Chicago. Actually, I'm just kidding. Maybe it'll be great. You know, it has director and choreographer Jerry Mitchell on board. That bodes well. I think we're all just a little curious about what story this show will tell exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I I have thoughts. Um, If you're planning a trip to Paris, you may want to check out Airbnb's newest offering, a Phantom of the Opera themed night at the Palais Garnier. Yes, the theater where the Paris Opera Ballet performs. According to People Magazine, guests will sleep in the Box of Honor, which is the main king's box or something on the mezzanine, uh, which will be transformed into a luxurious bedroom. You'll get a free tour of the theater, including the lake that's in the basement of the theater, which it's not really a lake. I don't know if you've ever been there, but there's kind of a trap door that opens and there is like a water system that I think helps with flooding and all of that. And there is a lonely little fish that lives down there. I was just in <laughs> Paris in May and they lifted up this door and this little fish, they turned on the light and this little fish came and like poked his head and they were telling us that, oh yeah, he's kind of the lone occupant of this underwater system they have. Oh, I so appreciate that color. <laughs> <laughs> um, you will also get an exclusive recital of the Paris Opera Ballet School a private ballet initiation with a POB dancer. I'm assuming that means a private lesson, maybe. Um, dinner in the famous Foyer de la Danse and a tour of the studios, all for only 40 bucks. The evening in question for two guests maximum is July 16th, and you must make your request on Airbnb's website by March 1st. How cool. And we are... Closing out the headline rundown this week with an obituary for the dancer, choreographer, and educator, Rena Gluck. She was part of the inaugural dance division class at Juilliard, where she studied with Martha Graham, and she went on to help bring modern dance to Israel. She was one of the founders of Batsheva Dance Company. Gluck was one day shy of her 90th birthday. If you have an opportunity to read the obituary in the New York Times, it's fascinating and just a really fascinating bit of dance history. Yeah, fascinating and important. Yeah. So that's the end of our headline rundown this episode. But don't forget to check out the Dance Media Events calendar, too, because it has lots more information about all kinds of Dance World events, including things like auditions, which we don't cover here in the podcast. So to see the full list and to add your own events to it, head to dancemediacalendar.com. Okay, now it's time for our discussion of a story that feels impossible but is somehow true. About two weeks ago, choreographer Marco Goethe smeared dog feces on dance critic Wiebke Huster's face. The attack occurred after Huster wrote a negative review of Goethe's latest work. And if you are the kind of person who listens to this podcast, you have no doubt heard many of the gory details of this story, so I won't repeat all of them here. In fact, even if you are not the kind of dance obsessive who listens to this podcast, you probably know the basics of it. It is the rare piece of dance news that has generated much mainstream press coverage. So Goethe was suspended and then dismissed from his position as ballet director for the Staatsoper Hanover. But after issuing a statement that was framed as an apology, yet 
did very little real apologizing, he kept his job as associate choreographer at Netherlands Dance Theater. And the Staatsballet Hanover will continue to perform his work. So that sort of range of responses has raised a lot of eyebrows. Obviously, for dance journalists like us, the stakes here feel particularly high, but it is worth unpacking why the conversation about Goethe's attack, which should be a conversation about violence, has in some circles become mostly a conversation about arts criticism and how criticism is the problem, which big yikes to that. Yeah, I still can't believe this is real. Um, This is kind of right up there with the Bolshoi acid attack from a long time ago yeah. and just kind of once again makes the dance industry and particularly the ballet industry look ridiculous. Like, Why are um, we writing Darren Aronofsky's scripts for him? We have to stop doing that. I know. That. I know. It, Netflix special coming soon. Yeah. And apparently, I mean, from what I've seen on social media, several other dance critics have said that Gurkha has had contacted them with angry messages or creepy messages after, you know, they themselves had written negative reviews of his work. So, you know, clearly he has an issue with negative feedback, but, you know, words are one thing. Dog feces is another, and there isn't really a more degrading thing that one could do to another human being, honestly. Yeah. I, so I wanted to talk about a, a quote from Gukka that was in one of the New York Times pieces about the attack. Quote, if I'd been a woman and the critic a man, this would be seen differently, unquote. Um, and also you're saying a lot of critics have been speaking out about having similar experiences. Mm -hmm. Most of them that I've seen are female critics. That seems to be part of a pattern. So first of all, this wouldn't be seen differently if it were a woman attacking a man. No, any artist attacking a critic with dog poop is an outrage, whatever their respective genders. Oh, of course. But I think we also should talk about the fact that this was a man attacking a woman, which there's an excellent essay in Van Magazine sort of unpacking how this whole ordeal is part of a long and very old story about men trying to silence women who challenge them or express opinions they don't like by humiliating them specifically. This, this mm -hmm. was like a violent assertion of power. And it's especially upsetting in a field where, though the majority of participants are women, men still hold so much of the power. And yet, yeah, somehow he is still positioning himself, Goka is still positioning himself, and has still been defended by some people in the field as the victim here, which you can feel pretty clearly in the statement he issued. Right. Yeah, I mean, it was two sentences followed by nevertheless... And then multiple paragraphs justifying his actions. I, I think there's a question here about what the role of criticism is, what we expect from criticism, which I think is at the root of why this conversation has become a little warped. Um, you may not like the way Husto is doing her job. It may hurt your feelings. You may disagree with her. But she was still simply doing her job. A critic's work is not to advocate right. for the artist. It's to advocate for the art. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, on the one hand, I understand, I understand what it feels like to read a review that's negative after you've put your heart and soul and all this work into something. Mm -hmm. You know, I get that. That hurts. It hurts a lot. But silencing critics is not the answer. I mean, I think we have all seen newspapers cut their dance criticism down to nothing. I mean, we mm -hmm. are down to nothing at this point. And, you know, I think we can all agree that dance criticism is extremely vital to this art form and, and that we have to respect each other, dancers and critics, you know, to a certain extent and be allowed to do our job. And this incident is just egregious. I mean, there's no justification for it. And any other employee anywhere else would have lost their job on the spot mm -hmm. for doing something like this. Yeah, that's what's there's something strange here happening too, where we grant more license to an artist and especially a male artist when things like this occur. Something that would be completely outrageous in another workplace. And we've seen this kind of pattern again and again happening in dance, particularly in ballet, because it's an artist, an artistic temperament. They're kind of a allowed a wider berth. Yeah. I think a lot of people are surprised at Netherlands Dance Theater's response. Mm -hmm. you know, for keeping him on. Like, I've had this thought, like, you know, of course they are, they know him, 
you know, we're reading about this in the paper and seeing this on social media. They've actually worked with him for years and and have a relationship with him, and et cetera, and all of that. But I just, I just feel like I've known people to lose their jobs for much less. Mm-hmm. I think what's also so disheartening about this, and this is sort of where we started, Amy, I guess, um, is that this is now how people see ballet. Mm-hmm. Like there was, there was a story in the Guardian that surveyed a bunch of arts critics about bad interactions with artists, because this is not the first time something like this has happened. And Lindsay Winship, the dance critic, what she said was that generally dance people are lovely, which I think we've also found Mm -hmm. to be true the vast majority of the time. In dance, especially, there's like this understanding that this is an especially embattled field, that like even among the arts, Mm -hmm. dance always comes last, and we have to kind of stand up for each other. And that's why, you know, films like Black Swan, that portray the ballet in particular as this like terrible cutthroat backstabbing world are so irritating to real life ballet folks. And that's why this real life story is especially dismaying to all of us. It's feeding a stereotype that really only reflects mm-hmm. a tiny percentage of people working in dance. And of course, this is the story yeah. that ends up all over the mainstream press. Yeah. You know, we have to see this assault for what it is. It's not an incident. It's not a situation. It's an assault. Yeah. And the police are investigating it. And so just say you're sorry, full stop, and pay the consequence. Don't change the subject and turn it into a different conversation and blame the victim. Mm-hmm. Oh, I have to like go shake out, take some deep breaths. I guess unsurprisingly, we're a little bit heated about mm-hmm. all of this. But in the show notes, we have links to a few different reports and op-eds about the attack that are definitely worth a read. All right. That's it for us this week. Thanks, everyone, for joining. We'll be back in two weeks for more discussion of the news that's moving the dance world. Keep learning, keep advocating, and keep dancing. Thanks, everyone. The Dance Edit Podcast is a product of Dance Media, publisher of Dance Magazine, Dance Spirit, Point, Dance Teacher, Dance Business Weekly, and the Dance Edit Newsletter. Our hosts are Amy Brandt, Courtney Escoyne, Margaret Fuhrer, and Lydia Murray. Our music is by Celestine, with special thanks to Broadway Dance Center for helping us record those footfall sounds. Find out more about The Dance Edit and subscribe to our daily newsletter at thedanceedit.com.